Well, hello, I'm Tom Sandry, and welcome to Medium Voltage Cable Testing and Diagnostics. This is part three of our three-part series. Now, medium voltage uh, power cables are the backbone of the power distribution system developed over 200 years. Currently, 2.3 million miles of medium voltage cable are installed in the United States, most with extruded insulation. Diagnostic testing technologies can differentiate medium voltage cables by their operational condition and aging process prior to faults, thereby providing guidance and proactive maintenance and asset management. Now, medium voltage power cables are conventionally rated from 5 kV out to 35 kV phase to phase. Installation of medium voltage cables has soared since the 1960s, as shown about 48,000 miles, 250 million feet of medium voltage cable has been installed in the United States per year since 1965. Extrapolating the curve to 2020, more than 2.3 million miles, that's 12 billion feet, of medium voltage cable has been installed more than 90 times longer than the Earth's equator. Now, although some paper insulated lead covered, high molecular weight polyethylene and cross link polyethylene cables remain underground, tree retardant XLPE and ethylene propylene rubber cable dominate newly installed medium voltage cable. Despite continuous development of dielectric materials, including insulation, semiconducting shield and jacket, and cable configurations, medium voltage cables degradate and eventually fail due to the aging process. More than 56.8% of faults occur in cable accessories, such as splices and terminations. Poor workmanship is the major failure mechanism in medium voltage cable systems. Diagnostic testing technologies are therefore used to discriminate defects prior to premature failures in medium voltage cable systems. Compared with other technologies, the partial discharge or PD test is a very effective method to recognize types of defects and locate defective components. Now, this webinar series has reviewed uh, the popular medium voltage cable diagnostic technologies, and now we're going to explain why the partial discharge or PD test is an effective tool to diagnose medium voltage cable. Interpreting data from on-site PD tests is also discussed because data interpretation is critical to achieving the expected advantage of PD testing. All right, but once again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start with a little bit of safety. So let's discuss prior to testing of the cables, setting up a safe test area. Now, when performing electrical testing on cables, we are temporarily energizing the cable with a test potential voltage. The cable under test is now energized and presents itself as an electrical shock hazard. Energy control safe work practices must be followed to mitigate this hazard. Electrical shock approach boundaries must be established at both ends of the cable to create a safe test area for work. Also, an energized cable can create capacitive coupling to adjacent cable phases. To prevent capacitive coupling, cable phases that are not being energized or tested must be grounded. Shock hazard is a source of possible injury or damage to health associated with current through the body caused by contact or approach to energize electrical conductors or circuit parts. 
it is current through the body that causes electric shock or electrocution. The potential difference a person may contact between conductive parts of equipment or between equipment and ground is important because this voltage forces current through the body according to Ohm's law. Therefore, current through the body increases with lower body resistance and increases with higher contact voltages. Now, back in the 1960s, the University of California in Berkeley, a tremendous amount of research was done on the probable effect of electricity or current on the human body. The maximum safe body current for short periods of time is given by Professor Dalziel's equation and is an inverse function of time. Higher currents are permitted for shorter periods of time, as we see in the equation where I sub K is the maximum safe body current in milliamps, T is the shock duration or time, K is the factor of body weight. Now, when we look at the probable effects on the human body, we see that at current levels as low as 5 milliamps, a slight shock can be felt. Not necessarily painful, but disturbing. Average individual can let go. However, strong involuntary reaction to shock in this range may lead to injuries. Now, we go up just a slight bit up into 6 milliamps up to 16 milliamps, now we're looking at a painful shock. Begin to lose muscular control. This is commonly referred to as the freezing current or the can't let go stage, where you lock on to the circuit. At 17 milliamps, extreme pain. Respiratory arrest, severe muscular contractions. The individual cannot let go and death becomes possible. Now, as an informational note, did you know that most DC insulation resistance test sets such as megometers and some high potential test sets offer output currents at the 3 milliamp to 5 milliamp level? So the mere use of these equipment, if used improperly, can create slight shocks, can create involuntary reactions to the shock that may lead to injuries. Now, did you know that a power factor test set, such as perhaps the Doble M4000, or certain high potential test sets, can output uh, voltages, or excuse me, can output currents between 100 milliamps to 300 milliamps. Now, at current levels of this level, ventricular fibrillation, uneven coordinated pumping of the heart, muscular contraction and nerve damage begins to occur. Death is now likely. So again, take time to learn your test equipment and learn safety protocol. Now, energized circuits or circuit parts put out electrostatic fields. These fields are created by voltage, and the two have a causal relationship, which means that the higher the voltage, the greater the electric field. Any circuit interaction within these fields can lead to electric field induction or capacitive coupling. Electric field induction is the process of generating voltages or currents to ground or both in a conductive object or electric circuit by means of time-varying electric fields. Since these fields have a causal relationship with voltage, approach boundaries for safety have the same relationship. Higher voltages require greater distances for safety. Remember, you don't necessarily need to come in contact with those energized circuits or parts for them to arc across and give you a shock. You just need to come within a certain distance. So, in the NFPA 70E, standard for electrical safety in the field, we see what is known as the limited approach. An approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part 
within which a shock hazard exists. This boundary is determined based on nominal phase-to-phase -phase voltage of the energized conductor or circuit part. We also have what's known as the restricted approach boundary. This is an approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part within which there is an increased likelihood of electric shock due to electrical arc over combined with any inadvertent movement. This boundary is determined based on the nominal phase to phase voltage of the energized conductor or circuit part. Now, the nice part about these boundaries are, since they are based on the voltage, whether it is the utility service providing the voltage or whether it is your test equipment providing the voltage, voltage is the same. Therefore, the approach boundaries can be used either for energized work where the voltage is provided by the service or these boundaries can also be used to set up your test parameters and your test area when performing energized or temporarily energized work. Again, to test the cable, whether it was the high potential test, the VLF, tan delta test that we discussed in the earlier webinars, or the partial discharge test, we must temporarily apply voltage. Therefore, safety parameters are required. All right, so applying that test voltage, obtain and review up-to-date drawings and prints of all circuits to be tested. If up-to-date prints are not available, circuits must be traced out and documented prior to any application of temporary voltage. Temporary application of voltage cannot proceed until the circuit path, potential backfeeds, affected gear and circuit access areas are known and factors are put into place to go ahead and control the temporary energy in a temporary energy control plan. When applying voltage to a circuit, you must treat all parts as energized. You must establish limited and restricted approach distances based on the applied voltage. When testing circuits, you must first verify where the voltage is going. As an example, verify both ends of the cable. You must 100% know the circuit paths prior to applying energy. <coughs> Excuse me. Prior to the test, you must barricade all access points. In high traffic areas, barricades may not be enough to safely keep people out, and an attendant should watch all access points. All right, now that we've gone ahead and covered safety, let's go on and let's now talk about the partial discharge test. A partial discharge is a localized electrical discharge that only partially bridges the insulation between conductors and which can or cannot occur adjacent to a conductor. This is a quote from the IEC 60270. When the voltage stress exceeds the breakdown strength of that portion of the insulating material, a partial discharge begins and continues to deteriorate that insulation. When partial discharge occurs, various physical and chemical changes may happen which produce emissions that we can detect, localize, and characterize to provide the information needed to prevent insulation failures of medium voltage and high voltage electrical equipment. Partial discharge occurs in solid, liquid, or gaseous insulating mediums. Partial discharge can also occur in the form of corona, surface tracking, or floating electrodes metal-to-metal -metal discharges, causing degradation of the insulation. Once partial discharge begins, it will always get worse. The NFPA 70B, Recommended Practice for Electrical Equipment Maintenance, states that insulation breakdown is the number one cause of electrical failures. 
Now, in some materials, the insulating medium is not completely solid or uniform, so there may be voids or air voids. Essentially, there are two sets of resistances, one of the materials and one of the air voids. The resistance of the material is higher than the air gap, meaning the insulation has a higher dielectric strength than the air pocket. As a voltage is applied, the voltage stress across the air gap is higher than the insulation. The walls of the gap are stressed and begin to break down or ionize. Eventually, these ions build up the, and the resistance of the air gap breaks down and a discharge occurs across the gap. Now, this can potentially leave semiconductive residue or carbon behind, which is conductive. This, or excuse me, uh, this is kind of like a stress crack on the insulation. Over time, this can build up and can create a full discharge from one conductive surface to the other. All right, now let's go into partial discharge testing on medium voltage cables. Let's review the standards associated with partial discharge. We'll begin with the IEEE standard 400.2-2013 the guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems using very low frequency. Now, very low frequency withstand and other diagnostic tests are measurements that are performed using VLF energization in the field on shielded power cable systems and are described in this guide. Whenever possible, cable systems are treated in a similar manner to individual cables. Tables are included as an aid to identifying the effectiveness of the VLF AC voltage test for various cable system insulation problems. In the keywords of the document, we see that partial discharge testing is mentioned and covered in this standard. Now, partial discharge testing is covered in section five of the guide, very low frequency VLF AC testing in subclause 5.5, partial discharge PD test with VLF sinusoidal waveform. Note, the subclause describes the partial discharge test with VLF sinusoidal waveform only. Partial discharge testing is covered in detail in the IEEE standard 400.3. VLF PD tests should be performed according to IEEE standard 400.3. The described method is based on the application of a pure sinusoidal 0.1 Hz wave to the cable system. The applied voltage of up to two times the RMS system lying to ground voltage may generate partial discharges at insulation defect sites. A traveling wave method may be used to measure the magnitude of partial discharge, locate and record the partial discharges from the various defect locations in the cable splices or terminations. There may be differences in the partial discharge characteristics measured at VLF and power frequency. The measurement of the test voltage should be made with an approved measuring system. Now, the IEEE refers to the IEC 60060-3 for descriptions of the approved measurement system. It is recommended that test procedures be followed according to the IEC 60885-3 where possible to aid in consistency of results. So here again, we see the IEEE referring the reader to the IEC documents. A transportable VLF sine wave generator is connected to an isolated cable system. 
The VLF partial discharge can be used as a monitoring tool during a withstand test. Test times and maximum voltages are recommended in Table 3 of the IEEE 400.2 guide. An alternative test procedure is to raise the voltage slowly to the withstand level while monitoring for PD activity. If PD occurs, the voltage at which they initiate is the partial discharge inception voltage or the PDIV point. The voltage can be either kept at this level or raised to the withstand level for a 20 second to 50 second, two cycles to five cycles, where the PD activity is measured before being slowly reduced until the partial discharge extinguish. The voltage or the voltage at which the partial discharge extinguishes is known as the partial discharge extinction voltage or the PDEV. If no PDs are observed up to the withstand voltage, the voltage is maintained at this level for a maximum of 30 minutes unless partial discharges occur. If PDs occur, the voltage is maintained for an additional 30 seconds to 60 seconds and then slowly reduced until the partial discharges extinguish. After the initiation of partial discharges, PDIV, an electrical tree may form that can develop into a breakdown channel within minutes. Every detectable partial discharge generated during the testing time is recorded in a computer-based system by magnitude and location of its origin. Now, the advantages are as follows. Cables are tested with an AC VLF voltage up to the partial discharge inception voltage, the VLF PDIV, or during a withstand test voltage level. The location of PD activity can be detected and measured. Cable system insulation conditions can be graded as no further action required, further study required, or action required when the measurement data are compared against historical established cable system PD data. Cable system repairs and or replacement can be made when schedules permit. Test sets are transportable and power requirements are comparable to standard cable fault locating equipment. In monitored VLF AC withstand test systems, partial discharge detection may be used to monitor partial discharge activity during a 30 minute to 60 minute withstand test procedure. The test becomes more useful after historical comparative cable system data has been accumulated. Now, among disadvantages, the partial discharge detection test may be of limited use when evaluating water treed insulation unless the electrical stress created by a water tree is sufficiently severe to initiate an electrical tree and there is PD activity at the test voltage. External surface discharges, PDs and joints and accessories, corona discharge, and cable attenuation may have a great influence on the PD test results. Cable systems must be taken out of service for testing. This may be a disadvantage. Some utilities may have components connected to the circuit being measured, for example, an oil filled switches that cannot be removed but can influence the test results. PD testing can be less sensitive on aged tape shielded cables due to corrosion on the shield overlaps that increase the impedance of the tape and increases the attenuation of the PD pulses. 
right, let's move on to the IEEE standard 400.3. This is the guide for partial discharge testing of shielded power cable systems in a field environment. This guide covers the diagnostic testing of new or service age installed shielded power cable systems, which include cable joints and terminations using partial discharge or PD detection, measurement and location. Partial discharge testing, which is a useful indicator of insulation degradation, may be carried out online or offline by means of external voltage sources. This guide does not include the testing of compressed gas insulated systems or continuous online monitoring at nominal service voltage. Again, in the keywords we see offline partial discharge testing, as well as online partial discharge testing, and just general partial discharge testing. Partial discharges are a consequence of local breakdown, either as a result of A, an electric field enhancement within or on the surface of the insulation, or B, a region of low breakdown field. PDs appear as individual events of very short duration, are always accompanied by emission of light, sound, and heat, as well as electromagnetic pulses, and often result in chemical reactions. The PD parameters that are usually measured during tests on installed cable systems are as follows. Partial discharge inception voltage. PDIV, this is performed during an offline test. Partial discharge extinction voltage, the PDEV. Again, this is performed during an offline test. Partial discharge location or partial discharge mapping. Partial discharge magnitude, Q. Partial discharge repetition rate, N. Partial discharge density, the density of partial discharge is measured per unit of time and per unit of length. Now this is typically performed on laminated cables only. Phase angle of PD pulses or theta, given by theta equals 360, Ti divided by T, where Ti is the time measured from the preceding positive going transition of the sinusoidal test voltage through zero to the PD pulse, and capital T is the period of the test voltage. Phase resolve PD plot, the repetition rate versus the phase angle versus the magnitude. PD magnitude versus voltage plot. The magnitude versus voltage. This is also performed as an offline test. The characteristics of the partial discharge parameters depend upon Type and location of defects. Example, PD sources in the insulation system, the insulating materials, operating conditions such as applied voltage, load, and time. Online tests can measure the magnitude, repetition, and phase angle at operating temperature, whereas Offline tests are performed on cable systems that have cooled down. Let's talk a little bit about water terrain now. Water terrain is an important form of degradation that can afflict older high molecular weight polyethylene and cross-link polyethylene extruded cables. At the site of a water tree, the insulation is degraded. Example, has a higher dielectric constant and lower dielectric strength than the original insulation. The water tree growth under service conditions is a very slow process and usually it takes many years to completely penetrate the insulation. Water trees do not generate partial discharge. However, 
Water trees can lead to electrical trees when subjected to high electrical stresses as a result of a lightning impulse, a switching or DC over voltage, a high AC voltage, or when the tip of the water tree approaches a conductor or insulation shield. It is important to know the materials being tested to better interpret PD data as the resistance to damage by PD depends on the insulating material. The order of PD resistance is crosslink polyethylene, ethylene propylene rubber, laminated, fluid impregnated paper. Cable accessories often made with filled rubber may have a high endurance to partial discharge activity, provided this does not occur adjacent to extruded cable insulation. Shielded distribution cables fall into two classes, those that are known as PD-free and those that are known as PD-resistant. PD resistant cable can sustain substantial amounts of partial discharge over long periods of time without failure. PD free cable can be formulated with a range of dielectrics having low PD resistivity. However, for both types of cable, certain forms of partial discharge will eventually cause failure whereas other forms of partial discharge can continue almost indefinitely without failure. Knowledge rules, which give objective guidance for the interpretation of measured data for the different materials in use are necessary. PD pulses are very short, typically one nanosecond to five nanosecond wide and they can have significant frequency components up to one gigahertz at its source. Two general approaches are available to detect partial discharge pulses in installed cables, which is referred to as offline and online detection. Offline testing is normally carried out using a separate voltage source after the cable has been removed from service. Online or in-service testing is carried out during normal operation of the cable system. Some advantages of offline PD testing are as follows. Partial discharge inception voltage and partial discharge extinction voltage can be measured if a variable voltage source is used. Partial discharge characteristics can be obtained at different voltages which can aid in the identification of certain types of defects. Now, some advantages of the online partial discharge testing are as follows. PD characteristics can be obtained under different load conditions, which can aid in the identification of certain types of defects. Tests can be performed without having to take an outage. Cable users often rely on economic considerations when they select a test method. The following considerations are recommended to a cable users in weighing the advantages and disadvantages of the available test methods. The detection sensitivity should be given high priority. Poor sensitivity may result in fewer problems actually being detected. The test method should be capable of providing pattern recognition to identify the types of partial discharge. The operating conditions of the cable, for example, the level of surge protection and the load history, as well as the planned load in the future, should be taken into consideration when assessing the risk associated with the detected partial discharges. The test method should not induce or aggravate degradation of the system. 
Now, the purpose of the test voltage is to produce partial discharges at locations where there are defects in the cable, the terminations, or the splices. Online testing uses system voltage of a constant fixed magnitude. The desired characteristics of offline voltage sources for field partial discharge measurements are as follows. The applied voltage should cause partial discharges in the cable, terminations, and splices that have characteristics close, if not identical, to those that occur when this cable system is in service. It should cause no appreciable damage to the cable system during the time required to perform the measurement. In the case of offline testing, the maximum voltage applied should be variable. The size and weight of the equipment to produce the voltage should facilitate field transportation. So, let's take a look at some of the alternatives to power frequency test methods. Depending upon the type of defect, sine wave VLF voltage source, usually 0.1 Hz, may require higher test voltage to generate the same partial discharge level compared with tests performed with power frequency, 50-60 Hz voltages. For example, the conductivity of the surface of a cavity that has been exposed to partial discharge increases, which allows any charges deposited on the surface by PD to leak away and thus lowers the dielectric field in the cavity. As more charge can leak away between polarity reversals at VLF than at power frequency, the partial discharge inception voltage at sinusoidal VLF will be larger than that at power frequency. If there has been no previous partial discharge activity to increase the conductivity of the cavity surface, the partial discharge inception voltage at sinusoidal VLF and power frequency will be similar. So, if you are looking at using sinusoidal VLF, it is recommended that this test method is reserved for acceptance testing of newly installed cables prior to energization if you wish to have comparative results to what would have occurred at the power frequency or 60 hertz test voltage level. Now, a VLF cosine pulse waveform generates a 0.1 hertz bipolar pulse wave that changes polarity sinusoidally. Since the sinusoidal transitions are in the power frequency range, the PDIV measurement will be comparable to power frequency. The VLF cosine pulse voltage works according to the principles of 50-60 Hz slope technology. This is particularly important for partial discharge diagnosis since reliable evaluation of the measured results require a direct comparability with the power frequency. Partial discharge characteristics change in the case of large frequency differences, making reliable evaluation to power frequency impossible. The 50-60 Hz slope technology ensures comparability for both voltage wave shapes. PD measurement is carried out during the slope of the applied voltage. The steepness of the VLF cosine pulse slope in comparison to the 0.1 Hz sine wave can be clearly seen. It is precisely this rise in voltage which is so important for the partial discharge inception voltage. Therefore, the 0.1 Hz sine wave test voltage cannot be directly compared to the 50-60 Hz power frequency, and critical partial discharge defects are therefore not always reliably detected. Okay, let's move now away from IEEE 400.3, and let's take a look at IEEE 400.4. 
Now, this is the guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems rated 5 kV and above with damped alternating current or DAC voltages. This guide uh, presents the practical, uh, excuse me, this guide <laughs> presents the practices and procedures for testing and diagnosis of shielded power cable systems rated 5 kV and above using uh, damped AC voltages. It applies to all types of power cable systems that are intended for the transmission or distribution of electrical power. The tabulated test results assume that the cable systems have an effectively uh, grounded neutral system or a grounded uh, metallic shield. Purpose of the document. The purpose of this guide is to provide uniform practices of procedures for performing uh, damped AC voltage offline tests on installed shielded power cable systems in the field to provide guidance for evaluation of the test results. As, excuse me, as at present, certain uh, test parameters and procedures require further study and clarification. This guide provides a starting point that can be grown and improved with time as more experience is gathered uh, from the field and analyzed. Now, another approach to reduce the size and weight of the test voltage supply from that of a conventional power frequency supply is the use of the damped AC voltage or DAC technique. For the purpose of partial discharge analysis, the cable under test is charged to the pre-selected peak value by a direct current high voltage source within a couple of seconds and afterwards short it with an electronic switch via a resonance coil. Thus, a sinusoidal oscillating AC voltage with low damping is created. The frequency is in a range from 50 hertz to several hundred hertz, depending on the capacitance of the test object. Since the frequency of the test voltage is close to nominal service conditions, all measured PD activities can be effectively evaluated and compared to that of power frequency. Due to the decaying amplitude of the test voltage, the partial discharge extinction voltage can be easily determined. Alright, now let's move away from the IEEE standards and let's take a look at some of the IEC standards. We'll start with IEC 60270. This international standard is applicable to the measurement of partial discharges which occur in electrical apparatus, components, or systems when tested with alternating voltages up to 400 hertz or with direct voltage. This standard defines the terms used, defines the quantities to be measured, describes test and measuring circuits which may be used, defines analog and digital measuring methods required for common applications specifies methods for calibration and requirements of instruments used for calibration. And it gives guidance on test procedures, gives some assistance concerning the discrimination of partial discharges from external interferences. Next, we'll look at IEC 60060-3. This part of IEC 60060 is applicable to the following on-site test voltages and in-service stresses, which are in relation to IEC 60060-1. Direct voltage, alternating voltage, lightning impulse voltage, and a periodic or oscillating shape. Switching impulse voltage or periodic or oscillating shape. For special tests, the following voltages are used. Very low frequency voltage. Damped alternating voltage. 
Now this standard is applicable to equipment with a higher voltage uh, U sub M greater than 1 kV. The selection of on-site test voltages, test procedures, and test voltage levels for apparatus, equipment, or installations is under the responsibility of the relevant technical committee. IEC 60885-3. The 60885-3 specifies the test methods for partial discharge measurements on lengths of extruded power cable, but does not include measurements made on installed cable systems. Reference is made to IEC 60270, which gives the techniques and considerations applicable to partial discharge measurements in general. This second edition of 60885-3 cancels and replaces the first edition, published in 1988, and constitutes a technical revision. Okay, so now we have a better understanding of some of the guides and standards that are out there to assist us in partial discharge testing. Now, let's go and look at equipment and some simple data interpretation. The first item that we will need is a suitable power frequency supply in order to apply the required test voltage. Next, a partial discharge filter will typically be used in order to clean up the output of the selected supply. Finally, a partial discharge measurement circuit that will typically be made up of a capacitive coupler and a high frequency uh, current transducer or CT. And this makes up the typical offline test equipment. Now, high frequency current transformers uh, or HFCTs. When PD occurs, there are small current pulses that are induced onto the ground shield or case ground. These pulses will travel dozens of meters along the ground grid in the form of high frequency current pulses in the range from 500 kilohertz to 50 megahertz, usually centered around 10 megahertz. High frequency current transformers are a reliable method to measure these high frequency PD pulses. In either online or offline cable PD testing, the localization of PD via the high frequency CT sensor is achieved by determining the time difference between the arrival of the initial PD pulse and the reflected pulse which has reflected off the opposite end of the cable from where you are testing. The speed of the pulses on the ground shield is like the speed of light. Exact signal speeds are known for various cable types. Knowing the speed, the cable length, and the time difference of arrival between the initial pulse and the reflected pulse enables the calculation of the distance to the PD. Cable partial discharge testing instruments have functions to identify these pulses and perform distance calculations. Now let's take a look at partial discharge patterns. If both sides of the void have similar insulation materials, then the charge distribution will be equal during the positive and negative cycles of the applied AC waveform. In theory, there will be two observable partial discharge pulses in each AC cycle of equal magnitude and opposite polarity per void within the bulk of the insulation. These patterns clump at the classic positions for phase to ground dependent pulses, that is, negative pulses at the 45 degrees and positive pulses at 225 degrees with reference to the applied phase to ground voltage. 
Now, service age cables may develop delamination of the conductor shield, resulting in a void near the copper conductor, or possibly a machine that is frequently load cycled or severely overheated develops a void near the copper conductor. A void bounded by the copper conductor and insulation exhibits a different phenomena from those within the bulk of the insulation. Though the basic breakdown mechanisms are the same, because the electrodes are of dissimilar materials, polarity predominance occurs. The mobility of the positive ions on the insulation surface is much lower than the negative ions on the conductor surface. The result is a predominance of negative ions migrating through the gap to the positive insulation surface. In this case, there will usually be an observable predominance of negative PD pulses clumped at the 45 degrees during the positive AC cycle. Now, service age cables may develop delamination of the insulation shield, resulting in a void near the metallic shield. As with those voids near the copper conductors, these discharges occur between electrodes made of different materials. Here, the immobile positive charges on the insulation and mobile negative charges on the grounded uh, metallic electrode lead to pulses occurring during the negative AC cycle. Because the metallic electrode is grounded, the observable PD pulses will be predominantly positive clumped at 225 degrees. Now, let's also talk about the effects of shield type. In most industrial facilities, a large portion of the cables are of the tape shield design, where overlapping layers of the copper tape are wrapped around the insulation shield of the cable. In addition, a widespread use of ethylene propylene rubber insulation is found in industrial plants. In contrast, the electrical utility distribution sector tends to use concentric neutral wires instead of tape design for the ground shields and crosslink polyethylene or true retardant crosslink polyethylene for the insulation. The concentric neutral wires hold certain advantages as the cable matures and begins to show signs of service age. As tape shield cables age and corrosion of the copper tape occurs, particularly at the overlap of the consecutive tape layers, the cable starts to attenuate high frequencies. Even with slight corrosion of the overlapping layers, the cable shield starts to behave as a coil or inductor to these high frequencies. The net effect of this attenuation is that a partial discharge detection system connected to a cable may not always detect the high frequency pulses as it would be so attenuated by the time it reaches the PD monitoring equipment. The further away the detection equipment is from the uh, active PD sites, the more severe this limitation becomes. This limits the effectiveness of partial discharge testing on tape shielded cables. Now, we're not saying that PD cannot be uh, detected on tape shielded cables, but if they are service age, corrosion on the tape exists, it can definitely affect the usable distance or length of cable that can be tested effectively. And that concludes part three of medium voltage cable diagnostic testing. Once again, I'd like to take this time to thank everybody for taking time out of their uh, busy days to come and attend our third Thursday webinars. Once again, I do truly hope that these are benefits uh, are, are beneficial to you. And without further ado, let's move on to our questions and answers.